I'm ready. All righty. Thank you everybody for joining us today. This will be a recorded lecture that you'll be able to check out later. So make sure to that you're registered on um, action.long.org slash community connections. Um, I first just wanted to share our um, our agenda for the series. Today we have Dr. Ramirez, which Tim will go into, um, but this is what it's looking like for the next few weeks. Make sure you're signed up. It's the same link as always, so feel free to just join us on this exact Zoom call um, every Wednesday from 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 6 p.m. Um, I am going to throw it right now to our board member, Tony Gwynn Jr., um, for a little introduction. I need to make sure that you guys can hear him. <laughs> the American Lung Association has been saving lives by preventing lung disease and promoting lung health in our local communities for more than 100 years. And today, achieving health equity is at the core of everything we do. We believe everyone should have the same chance at healthy lungs and clean air, but we all know that too often those families with the most to lose get the least access to quality healthcare, the finest hospitals, and even clean air. This is one reason we've launched Community Connections free, interactive conversation with San Diego healthcare professionals and medical experts on the health topics most affecting our communities. My fellow board member, Dr. Tim Morris of UCSD, likes to call them dinners with doctors. For more information about weekly topics and more, please visit lung.org forward slash events. I hope to see you there. Well, thank you, Tony. Um, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're very excited to be a part of this, of this series. My name is Tim Morris. I am a volunteer for the Lung Association. I am on what is called the Mission Committee for the Lung Association. And our job is to uh, help um, um, bring the resources of the Lung Association to bear to help the citizens of San Diego. And this uh, series is a large part of that. This series of uh, community connections, or I like to call it, uh, take a doc to dinner or have a doc for dinner, um, is made possible uh, through the workings of the Lung Association and by a generous grant uh, uh, from the San Diego Foundation. Uh, before we get started, I would do want to remind uh, you all that the Lung Association, as, as part of its effort to help you, has a number of resources available on its website. Uh, one of them is a vaccine toolkit, and that toolkit is there to try to help you um, uh, uh, better uh, make your way into uh, uh, achieving a vaccination. So there it is on the screen uh, for you. And there's some helpful tips in there about how to uh, get vaccinated, reasons why you should do it, wh what it can do for you, et cetera. And it might be a good way to start up a conversation with your friends uh, and uh, family and community if you've already been vaccinated, maybe to talk with them about it. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is that the Lung Association does have uh, some help uh, for you if you decide that this is the right time to quit tobacco use. And uh, we had a previous talk about this and during our Community Connections uh, have a doc for dinner uh, session a couple of weeks ago that uh, uh, smoking and vaping of tobacco products is actually uh, set your lungs up for COVID infection and it actually can increase your risk of getting infection and your risk of getting sicker if you do get the infection. So by all means, uh, stopping, this is a, sounds like a great time to uh, stop smoking. And if you uh, would like to do that, the Lung Association has some resources to help you. Um, uh, I also want to uh, just uh, go over the, the schedule uh, that, that Julie had uh, uh, up there before about the, uh, the Have a Doc for Dinner um, session. Uh, we started off with uh, um, uh, an initial um, introductory talk uh, about a month ago about uh, the relationship between tobacco products and COVID infection. Uh, last week, we had Dr. Welch talking about how to maintain your overall health during uh, the COVID pandemic. Those two talks are actually available. Uh, they were recorded and they're available online if you'd like to hear them. They were fabulous talks, um, very down to earth with some practical information. Um, 
We, uh, today we have, we have the honor of having Dr. Sidney Ramirez, who is uh, an infectious disease specialist and a specialist in the development of vaccinations and in particular vaccinations against coronaviruses. And she's gonna talk with us a bit about uh, the principle behind uh, these vaccines, um, what they are, what they do for you. Um, and uh, so she's gonna uh, speak for about half the session and then she'll be joined by a panel of local experts who will be able to contribute um, their own insights and we can have a nice little interactive questions and answer period where you, the audience, get to ask uh, Dr. Ramirez and the other experts um, uh, some, some questions that are pertinent to your needs. So without further ado, uh, uh, let me welcome Dr. Ramirez uh, and, and we're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you for having me and thank you for the introduction, Dr. Morris. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen at this point so you can see the slides that I've got for you today. So as uh, mentioned, my name is Sydney Ramirez. I am a doctor and a researcher. I am an infectious diseases doctor at UC San Diego and do vaccine research at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology with Shane Crotty. Um, have a background in coronaviruses and we study you know, vaccines and the immune response to vaccines in our laboratory. So a little bit of background uh, at this point in time, this is probably familiar to most of you. COVID-19 is an infection caused by the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. This is a relatively new virus. It was just discovered in 2019 and it predominantly causes respiratory illnesses like pneumonia. It's spread person to person. Um, so for example, by coughing and sneezing and unfortunately has caused pandemic disease and we're still seeing ongoing spread of this worldwide with um, continued infections. So this is as of today, the World Health Organization has a lovely interactive dashboard where you can check out the number of cases um, of infection. Unfortunately, um, several hundreds of millions of infections have occurred worldwide at this point and nearly 3 million deaths. Um, but one of the good things that we're seeing is the vaccination rates have really picked up for COVID-19 vaccines as well. So they also have a setting where you can flip and look at the vaccination rates worldwide. And we can see that we're doing quite well in the United States as far as the number of doses of vaccine that have been administered. And hopefully things will really start to turn around as vaccines increase and we see infection rates decrease. One of the things that I wanna point out is as much as we really stress that severe COVID-19 happens more in people over age 65. We have seen in the United States that about half of the people hospitalized with COVID-19 have actually been under the age of 65. So really we would emphasize that all adults who are eligible to be vaccinated uh, do get vaccinated and hopefully in the near future with the efforts from uh, Governor Gavin Newsom to increase vaccination to people ages 16 and older in the very near future, we'll see you know, that these hospitalization rates will go down for all age groups. So a little bit about how vaccines work and uh, vaccines versus infection. In our laboratory, we really look at the adaptive immune response. That's the immune response I'm showing here where people make T cells and antibodies that are able to fight off uh, viruses and other infections. So people can make this immune response that's specific to the sars cov coronavirus, either through natural infection, so getting COVID-19, which hopefully no one actually gets COVID-19, or they can actually develop the same sort of immunity through vaccination. And I'm showing the messenger RNA vaccines and the adenovirus uh, vector vaccines on the right side that I'll talk to you a little bit more about in detail as the talk goes on. But essentially what we try and do through vaccination is mimic um, or even do better than what you would see with natural infection. and elicit an antibody response and a T cell response that would be effective in uh, eliminating the viral infection or completely preventing it in the first place. So in the US, we currently have two main uh, COVID-19 vaccine platforms available for use. We have a messenger or mRNA vaccine platform. These are the Pfizer, BioNTech and uh, Moderna NIH platforms. And messenger RNA is the genetic material that our cells naturally use to make proteins, any kind of proteins in the cells. 
And then we also have adenovirus vectored vaccines. The one that's currently authorized for use in the US is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is also an adenovirus vectored vaccine, uh, but hasn't been authorized for use here in the US yet, although it's been used in the UK and Australia and a number of other countries. Uh, and adenoviruses as a group are weakened, well, as a group of vaccines are weakened cold viruses. The natural adenoviruses cause the common cold, and these particular types of adenoviruses are ones that are specially made to be used for vaccines. There are other types of adenoviruses that have been changed to be used for gene therapy for other diseases. So they're very commonly used in medicine. Uh, some of the comparisons between these types of COVID-19 vaccines, uh, the messenger RNA vaccines you've probably heard need ultra cold storage. So they need to be really at in a freezer, they can't be kept in a regular refrigerator for transport and for the most part for storage versus the adenovirus vectored vaccines that are easier to store. They don't require the same level of um, you know, freezing for stability. The messenger RNA vaccines here require two doses of the vaccine, either three weeks apart for the Pfizer vaccine or four weeks apart for the Moderna vaccine uh, versus the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is actually a single dose vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, which I mentioned we're not using currently in the US, that's actually a two dose uh, vaccine regimen, but also an adenovirus vectored vaccine. Um, all of these vaccines focus on the spike protein of the coronavirus. And in the case of the messenger RNA vaccines, they do so in the form of an RNA. And in the case of the adenovirus vectored vaccines, they do so in the form of DNA. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail uh, looking at these slides. So this is a schematic showing how the messenger RNA or mRNA vaccines work. So what they do is they take you know, the coronavirus, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. And on the outside of the virus, there are these spike proteins that allow the virus to normally infect cells. Uh, but what they do is they take the RNA that codes for the spike proteins and they put it inside lipids inside little fat droplets and they make it into a vaccine. And so when this is injected into the body, this lipid you know, layer is able to merge with our cells and the messenger RNA comes inside and it gets made into proteins. In this case, because it codes for the spike protein, it makes spike proteins. And these spike proteins get presented to our immune cells. So B cells are the cells that make antibodies. Helper T cells help the B cells make antibodies. And so we see that these proteins are presented to our immune system and our immune system recognizes them and makes memory responses that can be long lasting. And so if we ever see the virus again, either in the form of a vaccine or in the form of natural infection, these B cells, these T cells, they get activated and they'll make antibodies and they'll respond to the virus or to what they think is the virus um, in the, if it's actually the vaccine that they're seeing. The adenovirus vectored vaccines work with a similar sort of concept. Again, we start with the regular coronavirus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. They take this portion of genetic material that codes for the spike protein, and they actually put it inside an adenovirus. So these adenoviruses are changed. They don't have the complete adenovirus genetic material. They don't have the complete coronavirus genetic material. They're sort of a hybrid where all they have is the genetic material for the spike protein from the coronavirus. And then they have sort of the minimum requirements for an adenovirus to be able to get into a cell. And so this is injected similarly as a vaccine. And then this adenovirus is able to bind with a cell and enter the cell. It gets rid of the DNA that's inside of it. And that DNA becomes messenger RNA. And then just like in the prior slide, that messenger RNA is made into protein and presented to our immune cells that then recognize the protein, make antibodies and T cell responses to the protein and long lasting memory responses so that if we see this virus again or we see the vaccine again, we'll actually have a stronger and faster response the next time. So I work in Shane Crotty's lab. He's been doing a lot of outreach, lots of social media. Uh, you may have seen some of the videos that he's done or seen his tweets on Twitter. I'm um, using a lot of his tweets here just because they were followed by so many different people. So over 3 million views on Twitter, and this was as of last month. So by now, several million more views and Scientific American and a lot of other news outlets have um, mentioned his tweets or covered his tweets. 
So he was asked by a number of people, are RNA vaccines safe? And it's a really great question. And you know, we can look back at vaccines over time and see that there have been many campaigns, lots of famous individuals trying to really promote vaccination. Elvis Presley got the polio vaccine on the Ed Sullivan Show back in the day. Uh, currently, we've seen Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was the former governor of California, as well as the Terminator, um, and you know, former presidents line up to get the messenger RNA vaccines that have been made for COVID-19 to demonstrate you know, that they are safe and to do so in a public, you know platform. So if we look at messenger RNA, you know, we can think of it as like post-it notes. These are not meant to be long-lasting messages for the cells. They're just little temporary notes for the cells that tell it how to make the protein. And as soon as it's done doing its job making the protein, you know, they get shredded. They get wasted by the cells. They don't hang around for more than, you know, minutes to hours. They're not meant to be long-lived. So similarly, you know, he compared it to Snapchat. They're messages that expire. You know, they don't hang around for a long time. They get degraded by the cell or shredded up by the cell. They don't hang around long term. These do not become a part of your own body's genetic material. They're just a temporary message telling the cell how to make the spike protein. And, you know, in the case of this particular vaccine, there's a single protein that the cells are being told to make. They're being told to make the spike protein. If you want to make an entire coronavirus, you need 25 different proteins. So basically, by making this one protein, you can't make an infectious virus. You can't make more coronavirus. You just make this single protein. So again, just a reminder, the normal coronavirus has much more than just a spike protein, but this particular vaccine only codes for the spike protein. And so the only thing that comes out of vaccinated cells is this single spike protein. We don't see whole virus coming out of the cells. And this protein is presented to our immune system and basically tricks the immune system into thinking that you've been infected and making antibodies and T cell responses to this particular protein. Similarly, um, we could ask, are adenovirus vectored vaccines safe? And I think that this is a very good question to ask as well. And so in the case of the adenovirus vectored vaccines, similarly, the adenoviruses are just encoding one coronavirus protein. So they have DNA for a single coronavirus protein. They can't make an entire coronavirus. Similarly, the adenovirus vector itself, it's something that we would call replication incompetent in the scientific world, meaning it's not act, it doesn't have all of the pieces of the virus necessary for it to make more of itself. So the adenovirus vectors cannot make more adenovirus, so they can't cause like a common cold by making more adenovirus. And they also can't make more of the coronavirus because they only have the spike protein. So these are very safe. People worry about live virus vaccines. These are not live virus vaccines. So just a reminder again, you know, this adenovirus, it's designed so that it can get into the cell and deliver the DNA that'll become the messenger RNA that will become the protein, uh, the spike protein. But after that, it doesn't go on to make more virus. It's not designed to allow it to make more virus. It doesn't make more adenovirus. It doesn't make more coronavirus. And then at the time that Shane you know, tweeted this, this was back in early March, and he talked about how there had been over 70,000 doses of the RNA vaccines given to people and how we have independent safety monitoring boards. So not the pharmaceutical companies, not people who are out for you know, profit, who said that you know, these vaccines are safe. They didn't see any serious safety concerns. At this point, we can say there have been hundreds of millions of doses of both the RNA and adenovirus vectored vaccines that have been administered worldwide. And we don't see huge safety concerns. I will talk about a few things that have come up in the news, but generally these have been safe, well tolerated. I myself got the Pfizer messenger RNA vaccine. I've had both doses. I had some arm pain, a little bit of fatigue. Um, I can't say that I've had much more and that goes for pretty much all of my coworkers. Um, heard about some swollen lymph nodes, you know, feeling fatigued, not feeling too well, but generally um, minimal side effects. So at this point, as of a couple of days ago, Bloomberg has a vaccine tracking, um, a vaccine tracker. You can see that there have been over 689 million shots of the vaccines administered worldwide and about 170 million here in the US. So many, many people, lots of safety data. Uh, just a reminder from Shane, Safe doesn't mean the same thing as it didn't hurt at all or no fever for a little while. So if we think about going to the gym and working out and getting those sore muscles, 
you know, it's the same thing with the vaccine. Having some arm pain at the site of vaccination is actually a positive sign. It means that your immune system is responding and it's recognizing that vaccine and making an immune response to it. And just like, you know, the rock had to hit the gym to earn those biceps, you know, we have to suffer through a little bit of pain and discomfort from the vaccine in order to get protective immunity. And so it's really, you know, something where we should expect some pain and expect some fatigue, expect some, you know, they're not really side effects, but we call them reactogenicity. We should expect an immune response to the vaccine. And it's a good thing. It really does show that your body's responding appropriately. And then in terms of efficacy, this is just one example from one of the Pfizer vaccine trials. Moderna's vaccine trials had very similar results. I mean, we can really see, I don't think that you even need to look at the numbers necessarily. You know, the people who were not vaccinated had many, many more cases of COVID-19 than those who were vaccinated. We're talking about greater than 90% efficacy. So just to simplify things, imagine 100 people got, um, you know, 100 people were included. You know, if people were vaccinated, you know, more than 90%, 90 of those people did not get sick. And so very, very effective. Um, the population was incredibly diverse in all of the vaccine trials. If we look at the Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, all of the vaccine trials, I mean, they had multiple vaccine site, trial sites all over the world. They included people of all ages. And so we saw that the vaccines were very effective in people even over the age of 65, who are the highest risk as far as their age is concerned for COVID-19 and having severe disease. We also saw that the vaccine works, you know, well in all genders. So they didn't exclude people based on their gender. They also didn't exclude people based on their ethnic or racial background. And in the case of the Moderna vaccine in the US, they actually stopped enrollment of the Caucasian population to try and increase minority enrollment at one point. And so we know that the vaccine was very effective in minorities and we're including all minorities in this group. And in part because the trials were designed you know, they really wanted to have um, a population that represented the U.S. population, the world population as a whole. And so there have been some rare side effects that have been mentioned in the news and potentially uh, gotten much more news coverage than they deserved. But honestly, we should be transparent. You know, this is something that's impacting the entire world and we're all seeing it sort of play out live. It makes sense to get the news out as soon as we hear about it. So anaphylaxis is really a severe allergic reaction that people can have to vaccines or to, you know, any medication, essentially, as well as other things. And at first, there was some concern that there were very high rates of anaphylaxis with these messenger RNA vaccines, but that's really not turning out to be the case. So the CDC announced at the end of January that they were seeing about 2.5 cases of anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis for every million doses of the Moderna vaccine and about five for every million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, which is very you know, low rates of anaphylaxis. So really not something to be too concerned about. Thankfully, when you go to get vaccinated, there is an observation period. And so trained medical professionals will watch you and make sure that you don't have an anaphylactic reaction and they have uh, medications to treat in case they are you know, concerned that that is happening. And so it's very safe, plus the system has additional safety measures built in to make sure that this is not an issue because we can treat anaphylaxis. Uh, blood clots was something else that came up a lot. Uh, you probably heard that some of the studies uh, and some of the vaccine administration got halted in other countries because of concern for blood clots. But when they looked at the data, they really saw that there were fewer blood clots in people who received vaccine than they would generally expect to see in the population, you know, even in the absence of vaccination. So it doesn't seem like there's an increase in blood clot risk, you know, with vaccination. But again, this is something where um, they give people information about blood clots and symptoms of blood clots so that if there is any kind of concern, you know, people can be monitoring this is something that we can treat. But it really doesn't seem to be a true side effect at this point associated with the COVID-19 vaccines, but something just to be aware of, you know, regardless. There's also been a lot of discussion about vaccine safety in pregnancy. Uh, when they did the initial vaccine trials, they did not include pregnant women in the vaccine trials. But you know, we do vaccinate women with other vaccines during pregnancy, including the flu vaccine. And the FDA here in the US, you know, agreed that pregnant women can receive the COVID-19 vaccines during pregnancy, 
but recommended that like with any vaccination, they discuss um, the COVID-19 vaccines with their doctors. And at this point, there are no known adverse effects of the vaccine on pregnancy or fertility. Some women have said that they've avoided getting vaccinated because they were afraid that it would decrease their fertility or their ability to get pregnant. We haven't seen that. We haven't seen the vaccine causing harm in the, in the unborn babies either. And so, you know, that shouldn't be a major concern, but of course, every pregnant woman should discuss, you know, their own, her own concerns with her doctor uh, prior to getting vaccinated. And then as far as what we do know, we do know that if women get COVID-19 while they're pregnant, that there's unfortunately an increased risk of severe COVID-19 and even an increased risk of death that's um, pretty significant with pregnancy. Generally, women who are pregnant tend to be younger, tend to be you know, healthier on average than you know, other people, but there was unfortunately this increased risk. And so if a woman can prevent getting COVID-19, um, ideally through vaccination, we would recommend that you know, women are able to get vaccinated prior to becoming pregnant. And even you know, I would encourage women to get vaccinated during pregnancy if they feel that that's the best move for them after talking to their doctors. Uh, as far as vaccinating children, uh, that's another group where we need to do trials. Initially, the trials for the Vi Pfizer vaccine uh, looked at, you know, essentially teenagers and adults, so people over age 16. Uh, Moderna had initially started with people over age 12, and then Pfizer also started studying the vaccine in, you know, preteens, adolescents, so as young as age 12. And there's been promising safety and efficacy data at this point, so it looks as though the vaccine's effective in the younger age group as well as safe. Uh, kids tend to have stronger immune responses to vaccines in general. And so the main thing is figuring out the dosing for children. And especially when you consider that we're calling children, you know, babies all the way up through teenagers, obviously teenagers are adult sized and might respond more like adults. Uh, younger children who are smaller probably need lower doses of vaccines in general. And so they need to really figure out the dosing based on the size of the child and the age of the child. And that's why they're currently doing trials. Moderna and Pfizer have announced that they're doing uh, trials or will start trials soon in children as um, young as six months old and older. And so we should have that safety data in the relatively near future. And hopefully uh, children will be able to be immunized in the near future as well. And then just you know to point out the fact that really across the board, authorities from all walks of life, um, politicians, public health authorities like Dr. Fauci, uh, even religious authorities like the Pope have at this point come together and suggested that uh, all adults who are able to get the vaccine go ahead and get vaccinated for the sake of you know, public health for protecting themselves as well as protecting the greater community. And so you know, just to sort of round things out, I'll finish by giving you an example of an older vaccine, something that we've studied for many more years, the measles vaccine. You know, measles used to be a childhood illness that, you know, many, many children succumb to, but we've seen that, you know, even in 10 years, so from 2011 to 2021, you know, the, vac the measles vaccine, you know, was able to save 14 million lives. So vaccines were really amazingly effective to the point where we've kind of forgotten about some of the childhood illnesses that used to be so common, like in my parents' time, my grandparents' time, you know, because we've had vaccines in my lifetime, um, I, I didn't have to suffer from a number of the things that my parents and grandparents had to suffer from. And I'm very thankful for that. And I hope that we'll continue to have um, ongoing vaccination with the COVID-19 vaccine. And like I said, that children will soon be eligible and that we'll really see cases of COVID-19 drop across all age groups. And so I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you for your time and attention. And a special thanks to Shane, who uh, is at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology, as well as at UC San Diego, and who allowed me to borrow a number of his slides for today. And if you haven't checked out his uh, social media, lots of great edu educational resources there. I would encourage that you do so. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ramirez. That was just an amazing talk uh, and it, so much information conveyed in, a, in such a short amount of time. Um, I'm going to invite into uh, to uh, sit with you on the panel, a uh, number of experts from uh, the community. 
And uh, first is Dr. Michael Welch, who is, uh, gave the uh, talk uh, earlier in the series about how to maintain uh, lung health during uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, he is a pediatric uh, allergy and asthma specialist. Uh, on the adult side, uh, Dr. Praveen Akuthota, who is a um, professor at the UCSD uh, School of Medicine, who is um, an expert in the adult side of allergy and, uh, and asthma management. And then Dr. Fuster, who is also a, uh, a professor at the UCSD uh, School of Medicine, who is an expert in uh, disease, uh, adult diseases of the lung and uh, critical care. And, uh, and uh, I am also uh, on the faculty at UC uh, San Diego. I'll also be sitting in. So uh, hopefully we'll get a nice discussion uh, going here. Uh, and please, those of you who are listening in, uh, please type in your questions. I've already got a few questions that people have, have uh, put in from, uh, from the community. One of them is, is a first question for, uh, for um, Dr. Ramirez is, how did you get that picture of me lifting weights in the gym? I was uh, shocked if I thought that I kept that one hidden, but um, so um, one qu practical question is, um, the, is the immunity from infection identical to vaccination? Because there are some people that have asked questions of, well, if I've already had COVID infection, Am I already done and should I even bother getting vaccinated? Yeah, that's a great question. So our laboratory, we study natural infection and immunity as well as vaccination and immunity. Granted, the vaccines haven't been around quite as long, so we have less information on that. But in general, no two individuals respond the same way to either natural infection or vaccination. And from what we're seeing, uh, people who have had COVID-19 can still benefit from vaccination because they can make sort of broader immune responses once they get vaccinated. But there is some suggestion that, you know, depending on the vaccine, they might not need two doses. So for example, the Moderna vaccine, it's very possible, very likely that if you've had COVID-19, you only really need the one um, dose of the vaccine to get a really good immune response. Although, you know, it'll depend on the individual and how severe their initial infection was. Some people might benefit from still having two doses. But yeah, I would say at this point, we would recommend that everyone who has had uh, COVID-19 still get immunized because they can form a better immune response. So uh, thank you. And, and uh, some of the adult uh, pulmonary doctors may be able to, to share their experiences with uh, what people are calling the long haul COVID infection syndrome, which is, you know, the uh, people get a COVID infection, sometimes they can end up in the ICU and have the, you know, terrible time of it. Uh, and even if they survive that, they can end up having a, a bizarre um, syndrome afterwards. Some of it involves the lung and some of it involves just the general body and inflammation. And there've been some reports, I don't know if it's a placebo effect or not, but some reports of people that have that who have been vaccinated have felt a little bit better. And I, I don't know if, if uh, that has been anyone's experience here, but I'm certainly reading reports about that. Is there a bio any biology behind that or is that think that's a placebo effect? I might have to defer to Sydney on this one, but uh, um, there isn't precedent for it as far as anything that I that I know. But maybe Sydney could 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 correct me. But that doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means that it needs further study. Mark, have you had any experience with it? I, I I'm only more familiar with the not not the the sort of uh, differences the more nuances that you're talking about. And they might, might be much more than nuances. These might be big differences. Um, I just, my, my number of experiences of seeing differences like that are not as big as more the time course. That's a little more what I'm interested in is this kind of one to three month window that happens after COVID that um, is a period where, again, not to directly answer your question, but more as like an opportunity period where if, the, if it does make a difference to vaccinate, that's kind of the time window I've always heard. It's kind of like one to three months out um, and three months kind of pushing it, but maybe Dr. Ramirez can comment more, but that's where I get sort of nervous of waning immunity that from COVID itself, whereas I've heard that about three months out post-vaccination, your antibodies are very robust to these RNA vaccines and probably the window can be, I don't know, Maybe it's two questions in one, but it might be a year, or, you know, however long these your protection lasts. But certainly, Tim, from infection, um, these different syndromes and responses, I, I just don't have enough experience seeing dramatic differences between and, and remembering one was a vaccinated individual or one not in the short one to three month window post. Dr. Ramirez? 
Yeah, I mean, I agree in general, we need to study this more. I mean, I think the caller to the long COVID is what you're referring to. And we've had a number of people reach out to us and we're trying to study it immunologically. And there are reports, as you mentioned, of people improving symptomatically, you know, post-vaccination, but it's really hard in the absence of any like objective data to know exactly what's happening and what's driving the symptoms. You know, is it low level ongoing viral replication or is it immune mediated? I don't think we've figured that out. And so it's not entirely clear why vaccination might help. You know, if it really is low level viral replication, that would make sense that vaccination would, you know, boost the immune response, potentially get rid of that, uh, make people feel better. But if it's something immune mediated, you know, vaccination could also make sense. It could be a matter of shifting the immune response and making a more appropriate immune response you know, rather than having this lingering, maybe innate immune response that doesn't turn off appropriately. So, you know, I think we're trying to delve into that and we're getting a lot of interest from the community and it's something that we're actively investigating, but we don't have enough data yet to really answer, unfortunately. And one, and then, one thing I might conjecture just to bounce off that is that certainly early in the course of in fact, like of when vaccines just weren't out yet, there was potentially in that three month window at the end of it, I would wonder, and again, I'm not the expert here, reinfection, you know, potentially just because there's so much prevalence and you're not protecting enough at that time. And now, now you have more vaccines, but I don't know if that was some of the phenomenon, maybe more rare cases, but, but I would more throw it out there. Right. Um, so it sounds like there is at least some biological a possibility that this is more than just a placebo effect and people feel good because they got the, the, uh, the vaccination, that there, there could be something to that, but, but maybe the jury's out and maybe more to that. I have a question related to the answer to your last question, Dr. Ramirez, and, and you had talked about maybe um, if you had an infection that it's possible that maybe you would only need one vaccination uh, you know, to, to boost your immunity. Could you explain to us a little bit about why some vaccines require one vaccination and some two vaccinations? Is there some biology behind that? Or is that just kind of how they ran the studies? It's probably a mix of both in all honesty. Uh, so the Moderna vaccine, for example, is much higher dose of the antigen than we see in the Pfizer vaccine. And they saw that there was still good efficacy with a half dose of the Moderna vaccine, which would bring it down to like 50, you know, rather than the 100 that you get in Pfizer. So anyway, so it might be related to dose and the fact that you're giving such a huge dose of the Moderna vaccine that you don't actually need that much. And so it's possible that um, that's part of what we're seeing. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it is a single dose. And I think that part of the reason they've really promoted that is because it makes things so much easier administration-wise. You don't have to bring people back in. You don't have to worry about keeping track of people and making sure they get the same you know, vaccine twice. But there is a suggestion that two doses is more effective than one. And so I think a lot of it comes down to what did they do in the trials and what information do we have? And so we're sort of limited by that. And in reality, we probably could do a number of different things and still have similar efficacy. We probably could mix different vaccine platforms, change the administration, you know, routes and um, dosing and timing and still have efficacy. It's just a matter of, you know, what are you willing to do in the setting of a pandemic and what can you do logistically? So I think, um, you know, there is a lot of data to suggest that there's equal efficacy amongst the vaccines, but it's a matter of sort of how you give them and the rates of infection in the population and the variants that are circulating. And unfortunately, the trials were not all done at the same times. And so it's really hard to compare. And then they didn't use the same assays to look at neutralizing antibodies or T cell responses or anything. So it's really like an apples and oranges comparison. But the fact that all of them prevented severe disease and hospitalizations suggests that they have similar levels of efficacy, at least for the predominant strain that was circulating pre UK variant, pre South African variant. Right. So let me ask uh, I'll, uh, you, Dr. Ramirez, and I'll ask the rest of the people to weigh in. That some of the people listening in may have uh, be in this situation. They they could get one type of vaccination tomorrow, um, but uh, if they wait a couple of weeks or they drive someplace or something, they get a different type of vaccination. Uh, is there any superiority of one over the other? that would say it's worthwhile to just why don't you wait until you get the better one or drive to you know Riverside to get the better one or are they all so equal that it's just like if you had a table full of them you could just close your eyes and pick one and it would be just as, as good. What, what's your opinion? 
So I guess what I was trying to say is that, you know, at this point, it's very challenging to compare them all. But as far as preventing hospitalization and death, I would say they were all very similar and that we have to factor in risk, right? So if someone is a frontline worker or high risk, they're living, let's say, in an apartment with 10 other family members and everyone has jobs in the community in grocery stores, in meatpacking plants and somewhere where they're childcare, somewhere where they're at potentially high risk for getting infected. I mean, I wouldn't wait versus if someone lives alone and has the option to completely sequester <clears throat> themselves from the outside world and get all of their food delivered and everything else delivered. And they really, you know, have a strong reason to get one or the other. Maybe they have, you know, a medical condition that would predispose them to pick one vaccine over the other. You know, I think that would be a different scenario. But generally speaking, I would say we don't have strong evidence to suggest that people should, you know, wait. Instead, they should just get whatever vaccine they're, you know, able to get at the time that they're able to get it. Any comments from the panel about that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, but it's one of those things you have to always like um, reflect a bit on, is this what you would what you advise a patient versus what you advise a loved one versus what is best for, for society and kind of reflect on what uh, you know, is, is motivating advice and would you still give the same, uh, same advice to a, to a loved one? And I, and I would still give the same advice to a loved one to just get, get the one that you can get as soon as you can. It's funny that you said a family member, my daughter got Moderna, my brother uh, got J&J, &J, and I got Pfizer. So uh, we, we speak to that. You have a little experiment going. No, I, I feel the same way. I, I really can't weigh in. Opportunity is there, and there's just not enough big differences that I've speaking to a few virology experts and trying to get the most I could out of it. I, I agree with, uh, I can't have more say myself and just get whatever is available because of how good they are. Great. Yeah, I want to ask a question that actually came up on a previous conference, but but this uh, this uh, I think we've all had some time to think about that, and we have uh, some slightly different faces on the panel this time. But the question is, we're, we're going to talk about allergies in a second, so so uh, I'm I'm not asking about that. But allergies aside, is there a type of person who should not get um, uh, vaccinated uh, uh, with the, one of the vaccines that we've been talking about tonight? Is there, can you think of a type of person, someone's on steroids, a bone marrow transplant patient, take them, taking inhaled steroids, you know, any of a number of different things. Is there a type of person that you would say, yeah, you probably should not get vaccinated or, or you know, something like that. I, I personally can't think of one, but, but we have a big panel here. So what, what do you all say? Well, Tim, the, you know, the CDC is uh, the source here that you want to go to right away. And they, they say there's really no condition um, that would make it such that you should not get the vaccine. Um, unless you've had a serious reaction to the first one, they do, you know, hedge on that and say the second one, you, you may need to consider uh, that patient not getting the second one. But other than that, they really don't have much um, warning on people getting this vaccine. The good news is not a, a true live virus um, like some of the other ones that where there are concerns with this. Uh, it's a different platform and it's, it's, it's on the safe side in terms of allergies at least because it has minimal allergic uh, components to it. And uh, the data would suggest over you know the millions of doses already that this is a safe vaccine and people should not fear it. And those who have a history of severe allergies and anaphylaxis, we are asking, and the CDC has recommended, they stay a little bit longer after the vaccine than those who don't have that history. And other than that, that's really uh, the only concern they have. Well, since you brought it up, let, maybe let's look, talk a bit about uh, allergies first, and then maybe we'll do, and then we'll come back to the other question about, is there somebody that it's unsafe for. So let's talk a little bit about allergies. And I know Dr. Welsh, you and I have talked a bit about that, about, uh, you know, the difference between an allergy to the mRNA or the, the uh, you know, adenovirus, which is exceedingly uh, uh, rare, I would imagine probably not reported, and then an allergy to the carrier substance. Um, so could, could you explain that a bit? Well, there was concern with <clears throat> with the Moderna and Pfizer that both have a component called polyethylene glycol, that this might be the reason we were seeing some reactions. We had a run of these at Petco of about a month or so ago. But it's not clear why these people are having these reactions 
Uh, it is at a high, little higher rate than what you're seeing with general vaccines. The flu uh, vaccine story is usually about one in a million. We're up to five to eight with this vaccine, but we're still not clear what's causing that. And we don't have, therefore, we don't have any way to warn people other than, as I said, um, if you have a history of severe allergic reactions, particularly to medications, but even to foods, we're just simply having them wait longer. And the good news is that the reactions that have occurred and been, been observed have been treatable and have been um, uh, managed so that there was um, no deaths and no serious outcomes. They were all very treatable and uh, the outcomes were good. Great. Um, Dr. Ramirez, is, is, there a, is there an allergy to mRNA uh, or to the adenovirus? You know, there shouldn't be. As I mentioned, the messenger RNAs, you know, in general, messenger RNAs are a natural component of our own cells and they make all of our own proteins. So no one should be allergic to their own messenger RNA um, or to a synthetic messenger RNA that looks the same as what their body would normally make. Um, adenoviruses, I haven't heard of anyone having an allergic reaction. Obviously, they are a virus and we make immune responses to them. Um, but typically what happens is if people have been exposed to a particular adenovirus in the past, the vaccine will actually potentially be less effective because the immune system can wipe out that virus before the virus has a chance to make the spike protein in this case. But they tried to be really smart about which adenovirus vectors they chose for these vaccines and to choose ones that people wouldn't have pre-existing immune responses to, to try and give us the most effective vaccine as possible. But allergies, you know, shouldn't be a problem. Okay. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, the only... Two I would heard of to bounce off of what Dr. Welsh was saying is that polyethylene glycol and I, I'd heard of it again this is probably one in a million or more is polysorbate if there's just to remember a name of something they're both very related chemicals polyethylene glycol and polysorbate I think the polysorbate was the one in the J&J &J. and again like I don't know of a if, if you know you have a polysorbate as rare as that is that that's where I would just have some precaution with the J&J &J one that I've ever heard of and it's just bouncing off of what Dr. Welsh was just saying. It's just a carrier thing that would be very rare, but if you know of that or you've had a prior reaction, those are the two buzz names that go one for the other. So that's all I know, but otherwise that's very rare. Just for the people listening in, uh, when people, when the doctors are talking about a carrier, they're talking about the, the stuff that the, that the vaccine is dissolved in, the, you know, the liquid that it dissolves in because it may not be fully soluble in water. And you, so you put it in this stuff to keep, to keep it, you know, in solution. And that may be the issue of what people are having the allergic reaction to, if I understand correctly. Um, good. Um, so let, let me just, I don't want to too, too fine a point on this, but I do want to return back now to, now we've talked about allergies, but, but we, we all see some people that have some very serious um, um, problems with susceptibility to infection. And, and uh, again, I don't want to seem foolish here, but, but we all, you know, we have a nice panel of doctors, uh, you know, the, uh, Dr. Ramirez, infectious disease doctors, sees people that have, you know, their bone marrow is depleted from chemotherapy or some other immune problem, and they're very susceptible to infection. Uh, Dr. Welsh sees kids who uh, end up getting on corticosteroids and other immune modulators. Dr. Akathoda, the same with adults who are on uh, high dose steroids or high dose other types of uh, things that cause immune deficits. Dr. Uh, Fuster uh, sees patients that have lung cancer and getting chemotherapy. Um, my question is, um, are there any of those people that you would take care of um, who are, are uh, you would say are at uh, risk for having some problem with the with getting COVID vaccination, or would you say, look, you know, right in the middle of it all, in your worst moment of immune suppression, get vaccinated. It's a good idea. Maybe I'll start, Tim. That um, I, I the way I've been approaching this is trying to understand whether that's going to be a change anytime soon in that um, level of immune suppression. If I don't see any change in it on the horizon, I don't want to delay somebody's vaccine. But if, you know, if I, if I already know that this is somebody who I am doing some immunosuppressive therapy for a relatively short period of time, or even, you know, something that has a, kind of a shelf life, an end date that, that I have in mind already, then, then, I'll, then I might say, hey, why don't we delay this just a little bit? You finish your one month of 
steroids that I prescribed or whatever else. And then we'll, and then, and then, you know, stay, stay safe, stay distanced. Uh, and then, and then a month from now, get your, get your vaccine. That's the, those have been really the only times where I've let my therapy that I have the patients on um, change what I say about uh, timing of vaccine. You know, it may, it may just be my imagination, but I would consider that an angelic response, Dr. Mm-hmm. Dr. Tota. If you look at your yeah, I, profile, I, I, <laughs> uh, does anybody else have an opinion about uh, uh, delaying or, or um, uh, deferring the, uh, the uh, vaccine in people who have particular immune deficiencies? No, I, I, so. I agree with the, with the suggestion in, in uh, um, the patient who's um, on a short burst of steroids, for example, for a bad uh, asthma attack or for other reasons, if you have the opportunity to wait uh, 10, 14 days um, beyond the end of that, that burst of steroids, that would be a good idea. But um, I don't know, in terms of chemotherapy, that's usually an ongoing uh, treatment. It's kind of hard to, to wait for that to clear. I can't think of many other situations. Yeah, I, I, I just differ, agree in this population. All I've heard was the consensus supportive and, and short windows are, are important. Um, I, I only question if there was anything in a, like a, a, a part of the body is actually active that's dealing with the RNA and doing the presentation of the foreign thing to the T cells, which is right where you get the shot and the axillary lymph nodes in the armpit. If anything's like involving, you know, that's a matter of a short wait over dealing with another side or dealing, you know, just getting over a short window. So any of these immune suppressive, extreme immune suppressive events that you can wait a, a short period for, and I mean really short, that nothing else should take it out of the window. It's strongly recommended in all these populations. Great, Dr. Ramirez? Yeah, I mean, I agree with all of that. I just wanted to offer a slightly different perspective. We also see the HIV population, like I've got a Friday HIV clinic um, every week. And in general, one of the things that we like to caution, even our well-controlled HIV patients, you know, people who are you know, living with normal CD4 counts or semi-normal CD4 counts and undetectable viral loads, we just caution them and everyone else who's immunocompromised that they might not respond as well to vaccination. And then in the case of people who really cannot generate antibodies in response to vaccine, they're you know, potentially at the greatest risk, although the T cell component is important as well. So, I mean, we don't discourage them from getting vaccinated. I've been encouraging everyone to get vaccinated. And in many cases, you know, people's immune status, you know, it's not something that they can change. And so very often it's a chronic thing. They don't have the option of just waiting, you know, a short period of time for things to change. So we're encouraging them to get vaccinated and do it as soon as they can, but also to remember that those statistics that are out there, the, you know, 94, 95% efficacy that some people are quoting, that that might not apply to them. And so they should be more cautious about, you know, preventing infection and not getting exposed in the first place than someone with a completely normal immune response who's gotten vaccinated. Great. Um, the, the final question is, you know, kind of related to the question, to the, uh, that phrase about you got to dance with the one who brung you. Um, so is there, a, is there an advantage if you have, if you got the Pfizer vaccine, is it mandatory that your second one be Pfizer? And, and then a related question is, if this ends up being a, you know, something that we do every year, does that mean that if you got a Pfizer vaccination in 2021, do you need to stay with that one mm-hmm. next year too? Yeah, I, I don't think long-term that we'll stick with, you need to get the same you know, vaccine as a booster, especially because I do anticipate this will be maybe not annually, but semi-annually that will be boosted especially as they develop boosters for new variants. So I, I don't think we'll stick with that, but for the moment, for the sake of ease and for giving people you know, reassurance that what they're getting is similar to what was seen in the vaccine trials, I think that we're just encouraging people to stick with you know, what was done in the trials for the time being if they're able to, but obviously you know, supply and demand will sort of dictate what happens. And then going forward, I think we'll have a little bit more comfort that we can you know, mix and match. And that a lot of these, even though they're, they're different, they're the same general principle as far as how they, you know, elicit an immune response and boost the immune response. So in reality, they probably work very similarly and they are interchangeable. Great. Um, so, but for 2021, if you got one, if you got you know, one type, you should probably, if you're going to get a second one, you should stick with, with that one. Is that correct? 
Yeah, I mean, those are the current CDC recommendations, and I, I don't think we should deviate from that at this point because we don't have a vaccine supply issue right now in the U.S. Okay, and then one final quick question, which is, um, is, is the, uh, the problem with keeping the vaccine super cold or ultra cold is what you described it. Is that something that will always be there for an mRNA vaccine? Does the mRNA, you got to keep those things cold? Uh, RNA is much less stable than DNA. And so in general, you know, we have to keep RNA cold. Does it need to be minus 80 cold, like minus 80 degrees Celsius cold? Probably not. And they're seeing that. Um, and we know that, for example, the Moderna vaccine, they tested it at temperatures that weren't so extremely cold and it did just fine. So we'll probably back off on some of that over time. Uh, but again, it's sort of what was tested and what do people feel comfortable, you know, telling people uh, people is safe. So do you really want to tell someone, well, we didn't test it at this temperature, but we think it's still effective. Right. You know, so I think as we get more data, they'll ease up a little bit, but generally RNAs are not super stable. So I don't see them becoming like the leading platform in developing nations, for example, which is why we need other platforms like the adenovirus vector vaccines, because, you know, we really do need platforms that will work worldwide. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. I think we've reached the end of our hour. Uh, let me take a moment to thank the panelists that for a, a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Ramirez. That was really kind of you to take your time out from your busy schedule to tell us all about uh, vaccinations. Um, so uh, for those listening in, uh, as you know, this is part of the uh, our weekly series that we'll be doing for eight consecutive weeks. Uh, next week, we're at this very same time from five o'clock till six o'clock, we'll be having another expert come on and talk a little bit about the practicalities of how to get yourself vaccinated and how to make sure your loved ones get vaccinated. So until that time, stay healthy, uh, stay safe, uh, stay happy. Uh, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. And this concludes our, our panel. Thanks so much and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.